Hello and welcome to Maker Centered Learning Can Happen in Any Classroom. Thank you for joining us. I am Paul Shercliffe. I have been an educator for 25 years, mostly teaching physics and mathematics. You can find me uh, on Twitter at Shirky17. My website and email address are my name, www.paulshercliffe.org. Paul at paulshercliffe.org. There is a bit.ly for these slides bit.ly slash mcl capital m capital c capital l slides locate lowercase 2022 i will describe some of the facets of maker-centered learning like all things that are you know kind of wide and vast it's a little difficult to define and the more we try to define it the more we restrict it the less we understand it but we'll get some description then I'll go into some classroom examples as well as school-wide examples and finish up, finish up by sharing um, a few of the multitude of resources that are out there. Maker-centered learning is not a new concept. It is a mashup of those great pedagogies and ideas we were taught about years ago by Dewey, Montessori, Papert, Piaget, and Vygotsky. Whole child, choice, interest, curiosity, experiential, purposeful, time to explore, constructivism, constructionism, social, peers, student-centered, play, individualized. It's not one more thing to add to your plate. It's just the way to learn. I believe it's the best way that we learn. At the core is designing, building, creating of an artifact. We make stuff, we prototype, sometimes more than one prototype. There are conversations you can have from it or around it. Those conversations can be different for each learner and the teacher weaves the necessary uh, content, subject content matter into these conversations. The artifact can be the conduit through which all the learning happens and or it could be a demonstration of the learning. Conversations. The learning and assessment are in those conversations. The ones that you have with a student or a small group of students, as well as those that the students have with each other. These conversations can be while they are building as well as after they are done creating. Conversations, learning, assessment are just ongoing. Again, the conversations can and probably should be different for each lear for each learner while still weaving in content the emphasis is process over product making an artifact is important the design the creation but not necessarily the be all end all you can have the conversations without finishing the actual physical artifact so the learning can still happen obviously we want the students to learn how to be successful and to feel successful and finishing a product is part of that. But sometimes we don't have enough time for everyone to finish making something in class. Maybe be open to uh, extended time to finish the product. But the learning was already done and assessed. Let them finish the product too. At home, come in after, after class. That is one of the difficult parts of maker-centered learning. Helping every individual to be as successful as possible within our constraints. Making opens up and utilizes multiple parts of the brain at the same time and bridges them to work together. It is naturally transcurricular, blending various disciplines, often so you don't know where one stops and the other one starts. Am I doing math now or am I doing science now? Am I just kind of doing stuff? Everyone knows something you don't know. Give them the opportunity to share what they know. We were making wooden cube puzzle pieces, Soma puzzles for those who know. Some students were coloring with markers. Some were painting with acrylics or fingernail polish. One student wanted, wanted to hydro dip and I didn't know anything about it. So they told me what it was and what they needed. I just had to say, okay. They found what they needed in the room. People always ask, why do you have so much stuff in your room? My reply is simply, 
I never know what a student might need. They hydro dipped their pieces, then showed others how to do it. Some people call this distributed teaching and learning. Everyone is a teacher and everyone is a learner in a makerspace. One of the great advantages of maker-centered learning is that there are so many modalities and ways of making. They can be digital or analog. They can be low cost or expensive, low tech or high tech. Drawing, painting, modeling, coding, robotics, poster design, video, podcast, gardening, woodworking, play, songs. Because there are so many, every learner should be able to find some that speak to them. Students might already be doing things that we wouldn't have thought of. Listen to them. Give them space to try things. You don't have to know how to do everything. You can't be expected to. You just have to be comfortable with exploring the unknown with others. Remember, everyone is a teacher and everyone is a learner in an MCL environment. A student was explaining their work to me, what they had done so far, what they had learned, telling me what they needed to do next. When a nearby student overheard and said, I already did that. I can help. This from a student that normally keeps to themselves and struggles with getting steps accomplished. Maker-centered learning helps develop agency. Students learn to know what they know and what is next. They also like sharing and helping others. Building confidence is important. Empowered is, is a good word. MCL is very much learner-centered and offers many opportunities for voice and choice. The conversations come from their perspective. What do they want to make? or How do they want to make it? What materials do they want to use? There are often many paths to get to our learning goal. Sometimes we have to limit the choices and give them a list of options for our own sanity. But we still need to listen to that one student who often has a different idea or path. Making allows students entry points to the learning from their point of view or perspective. A conversation with the learner who will probably be an engineer starts differently than the one who will probably be an artist. But both conversations can evolve to discuss the content that is at hand. Studying Newton's laws through mousetrap cars, the engineer wants it to go the furthest, function. The artist wants it to look good, form. We can have both of those conversations. They can tweak their design to incorporate what they want. And we can still weave in ideas about Newton while that is happening. When they start from their own perspective and viewpoint, conversations are much easier to have. And the learning is in the conversations. Maker-centered learning fosters the seeds of education that people like to talk about. But for some reason, people always leave the most important one out. Curiosity. The others follow from it. Creativity, collaboration, communication, critical thinking, community. Yes, makers build communities, as well as help their community. There are many other C's that you could come up with, as, a Twitter, as the Twitter community did during a road trip by some educators. Come up with your own. People like to talk about creativity a great deal, and for good reason. There are many benefits to developing a culture of creativity. Learning activities become multidisciplinary. Self-expression is prevalent. Thinking and problem solving are needed and happen. Stress and anxiety are reduced. Our minds end up, end up in a happy or fun zone. We feel a sense of purpose. We feel pride in accomplishments. We find others with similar passion. Our ability to focus increases. So does our risk taking. We come to learn that progress takes iteration. We start down a path to innovation. We understand that learning is a lifelong journey. Making is just good for us. It helps us find a sense of accomplishment. We remember things that we make, not tests that we take. Dan Ryder shared via Twitter an example of a student that couldn't stop sharing the chessboard they had made. Look what I did. 
Can you picture the student smiling as she shows off her work? The pride, the accomplishment, the success. I made something that I can use in this world. We are born makers. Mud pies, blanket forts, sticks for swords, tea time. It is how we understand the world. But for some reason we stop. Then wonder why we don't understand the world. The world is a STEM maker lab waiting for us to explore it. What kind of maker are you? Sewing, baking, metalwork, gardening? I've always been into electronic gadgets and technology. I really got into woodworking about five years ago, created a garage workshop. Let's take three minutes to think about and share in this Padlet uh, what we make or what we'd like to learn to make. bit.ly slash I am a maker, all lowercase. Five, four, three, two, one. So hopefully you're looking at what other people were putting on there. Here are some of the answers from one school. Look at the variety. Wouldn't this be a good activity to do with staff? Find people with common interests. Now that you have a partner in crime, you found that common interest, how could you incorporate your making into classroom learning experiences? Could this lead to a teach like a pirate day? Do it with the kids and see what things they already do and help them find others with similar interests. Maker is a mindset, a way of approaching things. There is a willingness to try new things. I can fail and try again and eventually get something. I can take things apart and understand them. I can mash things up 
and make something viable. I can man manipulate things in the world to fit me or help my community. I can impact the world around me. Ideation, prototype, iteration. If I am given time and space and support. John Spencer made a nice graphic about some of the offshoots of maker mindset. Empathy. We learn it. We learn to begin with it. Explorers. We want to know how things work and how we can adjust and adapt them. Engaged. We are more. F we have more focus and attention. Risk takers. We will try new things because failure is all right. It just means to try something else. Divergent. We think differently and see that all people are different with various strengths and weaknesses. Connections. We connect different ideas as well as with different people. Problem solving. We can do almost anything because we know how to solve problems. Learners build competence and confidence with processes, materials, and tools. Being inventive and innovative also comes from a maker mindset. I think that maker mindset helps us to discover our passions and interests. What are we interested in? What are we good at? Currently, because those can change as we grow. So we need to keep supplying learners with this kind of environment as they grow and change. You are probably already doing some maker learning. What are ways that you already include maker? and your learning experiences in your classroom. Here's another time for us to share and talk about them. Bitly forward slash maker students. We'll take two minutes this time. I know it's a three minute timer. I'll stop. Ten, five, four, three, two, one. All right. So hopefully you're looking at things people are already doing. These uh, here are some ways that one group shared that they incorporated making in their classroom. What conversations could you have while doing? this making tamales we're talking culture we're talking history we're talking science we're talking math measurements drawing after reading their own story roller coasters lots of physics lots of math but also lots of design for you know um graphic design 
making Play-Doh, science. Then what can they make th with the Play-Doh to represent things? Painting, rockets. I love rockets. Um, you could be reading a book, Rocket Boys, and discussing the book. You know, there's our rockets some part of the theme in the book? Um, cool Whip to paint. Corn husk dolls. Uh, dolls, what culture? Jewelry, someone had jewelry before they made bracelets. Here we go, bracelets, jewelry. Jewelry, I'm thinking culture, history. Um, slime, uh, chemistry, math, obviously. Um, but also, is there a story or a movie that you're talking about in the themes that you can make and play with slime while you're talking them? Um, snowflakes. So many things to do with snowflakes. Where is snow a theme in something? And we can make snowflakes. And there are lots of ways to make snowflakes beyond just the paper uh, cutout. That's what we want to do. What can we make and what conversations can we have? You know, so here I'll, I'll tell you about some uh, some examples uh, that I've seen in, cl in class. Um, if you want to learn about measurement or scale or proportion, you got to make stuff. Even if you make your own measuring devices. Uh, the top example is designing a measuring device. It was a 10 centimeter ruler and they were just, we were just putting tick marks every centimeter. And then you start deciding how many tick marks do you need? You know, nothing, nothing teaches you better about what the tick marks mean than if you actually have to put them on the measuring device. Um, so you make, you make rulers, um, you can design shapes in 3D. You know, what's the mean for something to be 50% bigger or 50% smaller? You know, you can do them digitally, do them physically. Just let me just cut things out of paper. Cut out a square. Cut out a square that's 50% bigger. Um, and the, the the idea was making some of this stuff is you get the, the kids get to personalize it. They put their own imprint on it. It's theirs. It's them, kind of thing. Um, that's an important part of maker centered learning: personalization, individualization. In geometry class, uh, you know if you're studying shapes and have some geometry concepts, you got to make them. You got to make the shapes. Uh, various sizes, various materials, discuss the properties, uh, discuss the materials. One year in geometry class, you know, we partnered up and we built geodesic domes out of straws and pipe cleaners. The, the pentagon and the triangle are the only two shapes you need to make um, geodesic domes. So now you can talk about um, making domes for Mars, for the moon, for whatever wherever we're going to la land. So we're talking space. We're talking, uh, we can be talking some literature, some books about space and living on those planets. Um, we then also divided the class in half and uh, we built them out of PVC. They're seven foot tall. And so the kids, the, the kids divided up, decided um, which roles they wanted to play. They were the constructors. But we added something with this is that they had the market their dome as something um, as a greenhouse as a storage shed as a playground thing and they had to make flyer uh, they had to design a flyer they had to make a commercial um, so they they choose which role they want to do but the great thing was they did crossover with the roles the kid who was designing you know flyers he they went and did some construction the kids who were doing some construction decided to go you know work with the movie people a little bit and they just did that on their own you know, if you want to talk about Newton's laws of motion, you got to build. You got to build things that move, make stuff that moves. Uh, we've done hovercrafts, we've done um, mousetrap cars. You know, ask a lot of questions. That's that's where all the things happen. Listen to the questions they come up with. You know, on the, on the hovercraft, why did we run into the wall? Always came up something about friction. You know, um, how can we go faster? How can we go? How can we make the, the mousetrap car go further? Can we do this? Well, maybe. Let's talk about that. Make, make sure it's safe, you know. And then, how would you do it? I mean, all the, those conversations. If you need to explore buoyancy, you got to make things that float. Uh, you can start with paper. You can start with foil, cardboard. You get to talk about do those things float? Why do they float? Why don't they float? You know. And if you can three D print, great. But 
man, you don't have to. You know, it's always best to start with very low cost, quick prototypes. And you can move on to better materials. If you have a pool available to you, and they don't mind this, um, build people sized boats out of cardboard. See who can get to the other side before sinking. I've heard I don't I've never been able to do that, but it looks awesome, and I've heard people have such fun with that. You know, when in biology, you know, if you have biology standards and you're learning about biomes, you know, kids have to represent and explain important aspects of their biome. Well, one kid liked to paint, so they brought in a little canvas and their paints, and they painted their biome. A bunch of kids like to draw, so they're they're drawing. Uh, they're by now some parts of the drawing are better like the one said well, I don't draw you have a camel I said I don't draw a good camel I said that's okay I don't care but that cat those cacti are awesome those mountains oh my gosh you know that's that's great you know they all had to explain what and why for the things they put in their work kids like to make models the diorama kind of thing oh, great fine what do you need from me you know that works too uh, some wanted to make websites okay Great opportunities for student voice and choice. You know, here are the constraints for our goal. How do you want to accomplish that? We also got to have fun with with the cricket um, that I have. Uh, students cut a vinyl sticker out of their favorite animal from their biome. You know, they had to find an image in the proper format. They had to get it to the cricket computer, get it into the software and adjust it. Load the material on the cricket, press go, peel, as in weed the vinyl. You know, lots of skills involved. And while they were doing all that, we talked about the animal and the habitat. We could have those conversations. They got to take the sticker home or put it on the computer or their phone, whatever. Uh, this is a poster-sized piece of paper that I put up, and then we were sticking up the negatives uh, so people could see uh, what we were doing. Um, and yes, some kids got decided to do Disney princesses, but that was after they had done their, their animal. The cricket wasn't in use. I said, hey, can I? Yeah, go ahead. Monsters. Who doesn't like monsters or mythological creatures? In biology, we have to study reproduction and genetic traits. So this is a great way for them to get into that by designing a set of parents with certain traits. You got to pick like a handful of traits that um, to deal with. Um, and then they breed them. Well, but theoretically. Uh, now the students then need to create the offspring to demonstrate, you know, the dominant and recessive traits. Interesting enough, sometimes kids want there to be three parents, and then we got to figure out how that might work. And so that's, that's great. They're thinking, that's awesome. You know, here's, you know, the voice and choice. You know, they, they could draw them, they could color them, uh, they could design them in Tinkercad. You don't have to 3D print them or if you don't have that potential, but you can if you do. Um, we could do some sewing and make plushies. You know, get some different materials. How about plushies to donate to a children's hospital or homeless shelter? That would be an interesting extension for this. You know, in a lot of science classes, we always talk about study earthquakes. Well, you know, an important aspect is how earthquakes affect buildings. So have them build some buildings and put them on a shake table and shake them and see what happens. You know, start with simple and expensive materials. Have discussions. Change the materials. See what happens now. Spaghetti works, coffee stirs, toothpicks, popsicle sticks. You know, what else would you use? How many board games already exist? How many board games about historical times or historical events? What board games could students make? The one on the left is actually student made. You know, to explore or demonstrate their understanding of an event a time, a place, a person. You know, design your board, design your pieces. What are the rules of play? Ask questions. Listen to conversations. You could do it all out of paper. You could throw in some cardboards, maybe some index cards. You could 3D print stuff. You could laser, you know, whatever tools and materials you have, you can do this with. You know, what topics could be turned into a board game or a computer game for that matter? Some kids can do that, and it's not that hard anymore to make computer games. Simple, basic ones. You know, do you need to study the Roman times? Well, do it while building catapults. Make them little, make them big, whichever. 
have lots of discussions about the rise and decline of the empire, the wars, the science and engineering of the time. What is projectile motion? What's precision? What's accuracy? You know, do you have some war to discuss other than your know, Roman times? Well, have the kids build the machines of that war and just let the discussions go. Use the materials and tools that you have. For a couple years in physics class, we did trebuchets. Um, we did them as an at-home project, and they brought them to school on one or two days, and we launched them out, out in the field. And we had some mixed results, so we had some parents you know, involved too much um, in the building, and you know, the, the kid watched and the parent did it, which is not what we wanted, but sometimes that happens. Um, but then when we moved to doing it in class, and we just did two by fours, and we did um, shorter, smaller ones, and everyone kind of had the same, and um, then every kid was, was actually doing some building then, and that was much better for that. Um, and we have the discussions while they built. That was, again, that's the important part. We didn't just want the product at the end. We wanted the discussions while we build. And I think that is a big reason why that project got better is because we did it in class. Um, there's a flaw of having a dozen trebuchets in your room um, because they take up a decent amount of space. You know, what do you learn from reading a book? That's always a big thing in English. What, what did we learn? Uh, there's so many things that kids could make in order to open up that conversation. So much imagery that they can utilize. A student of Kim Stanley made a lampshade with key points from the book Just Mercy. And a great, <laughs> shining the light on social injustice. I mean, just a great metaphor. It was just, uh, just awesome. Uh, candle boxes, uh, electric tea lights. Easy thing to make. Imagery can be on the side. These don't necessarily have much imagery but you can see where instead of just designs and patterns they could be imagery uh, students have to share and discuss why they chose images and what those images meant to the meant to the story students can make props from a story and discuss their importance you know be the prop department having that physical artifact makes the conversations flow easier how many ways can you think of to literally make poetry not just writing poems on a piece of paper and turning them in. David Thoreau has students take a walk and capture pictures of words. Then they do some cropping and arranging to make short poems. I think that's, that's an awesome thing to do. Really great with thinking. Okay, the poems are short, but that gets them, gets them going. You know, I could then easily see students you know, creating their own longer poems then working with a friend um, to take a picture or themselves to actually take picture work with a photographer not just do a google search to you know find an image kind of thing but collaborate with a photographer be creators not consumers yes i think all schools should have poster printers and that they're constantly used by students and you're changing out posters in the hallway um, for the students Dan Ryder and his class reads Of Mice and Men, and he wanted to get beyond you know, your basic PBL and get into more of the idea of not just projects, but problems. Um, kind of, you know, what, what can we think of in more empathy, more service-oriented kind of thing? You know, so they asked the question when they were reading Of Mice and Men, you know, what do the men in this story need? And the short answer came up is, well, they needed a place to call their own that was affordable. So what became came of that was of mice and tiny houses, where students would design and build models of tiny houses based on the needs of the men with evidence from the book. They have to consider budget. They'd have to research migrant workers in the 30s, interview some current tiny house builders for construction tips. Um, and, you know, Dan talks about that he and his students feel the skills and thinking from this will last a long time. Dan has an idea that schools can be problem-solving incubators driven by empathy. You can work with some facets of com computer science like coding and robotics uh, for different things like code blocks. The thing on the left is part of Tinkercad. It's browser-based and it's a way to code designs. Um, it really thrives when you know things need repeated. You see, you just put them in repeat loops. Um, 
students could explore patterns or tilings. So we talk about the, the math there, but there's also the mosaics uh, from historic, from cultures and from history. Uh, those patterns, you know, what are what, what, what were the important designs uh, from different architectures? Um, they could be uh, designing things found at a dig site for an ancient civilization, like vases or urns. Um, and then if you could 3D print them, that'd be even better. Uh, robotic kits could animate scenes from stories in pretty much any subject. And you, that's a micro bit on the left. And the, if you look in the middle, the second picture, uh, or, or to the right of it, that yellow thing is actually a motor that's going to turn something. Um, you can use inputs like buttons or distance sensors and motors or LEDs and sound. Uh you can do it in block coding. You can do it in, in uh, Python, Java. But again, you're, you're coding a scene from a story. Fashion, so important to kids. We can't forget they like creating things that they wear. Um, code blocks, turtle art, turtle stitch are great ways to create items, including iron-ons for t-shirts, jewelry, that can be 3D printed or laser cutted, um, and then embroidery patterns. That if you got an embroidery embroidery machine, what things could you discuss with gardening as the focus? Whether you have an outdoor garden, a greenhouse, or an indoor garden, and I think all schools should have all three of those. Uh, you're talking about native plants. You can talk about climate and weather, food's role in a culture. Farming versus industrial society, nutrition, diets around the world, spices, spice trade, uh, measurement, food deserts. Uh, what community service could you do as an offshoot? I think a lot of conversation, again, it's about the conversations you can have while you're doing, working, creating, making something. John Umekubo and his students create some awesome layered 3D designs. They've got a laser cutter and, and can work this. You don't have to have a laser cutter. Uh, just think of what kinds of 3D sceneries uh, with layers could students create in your subject area. Uh, I mean, you could see atoms in science class, right? What kind of discussion could students have while they create these? Can they do scenes from a book? Can they do, they do scenes from history? Washington crossing the... Uh, now I forget what the river is. Um... You know, what stories or poems could they write based off a scene that they design? You can do these in just paper, cardstock. Uh, you could use a Cricut or a Cameo. You know, you could you could 3D print layers. I mean, whatever tools, you materials you have, you utilize. You could even add some LEDs to bring in circuits. Remember, it's all about the conversations that you can have surrounding an artifact. The learning and assessment is in the conversations that you have with a student, that students have with each other. Process over product. So think of the conversations that you can have around an artifact. Maker is a culture. Not something you write into a lesson plan once in a while. Not a special day. Not just a room in the building. Culture is what you intentionally do every day. And it gets built by tiny actions all around us. For Maker Center Learning, it can be about having splashes of and opportunities for curiosity and creativity all around the building and campus. One school took the old trophies out of a hallway case and replaced them with the parts to build a computer. No real instructions, just an opportunity to put things together and make a working computer. When it got done and, and the admin saw that it worked, the kids took it apart for another set of kids to try. What other devices or items, machines, could you put in a hallway for students to assemble? Do you have a metal door? Do you have some magnet tiles? Put them up and see what designs people come up with. Be aware, sometimes the tiles might go missing. There are some very inexpensive ways to create a physical light bright. The Children's Museum of Cleveland uses pool noodles. 
pool noodles are an awesome maker material. Get them in the summertime at the dollar store. Colored golf tees and pegboard is another method. Put up a chalkboard in the hallway for doodling, poetry, or graffiti. Yeah, you could try chalkboard paint on a surface. If you prefer, you could use a whiteboard. Yes, we have to monitor what goes up on the board, but that's nothing new. The hallway near the Western Reserve Academy Makerspace has a light bright kind of device. It's actually made up of uh, light dials that when you tap it, it turns on, and when you turn it, it changes color. What kind of interactive walls could you create? Legos? Marble room? Put up a challenge table. Mark Karcher has tried an origami challenge once in a while, and the kids love it. He puts out paper and a QR code for instructions. He has found that students get a little bored if it's always origami. You could try some building with straws. Strawbies is one brand of connectors. There are others. You could put pieces of pipe cleaner for connectors. You don't need a whole pipe cleaner to connect straws, so cut them into pieces a couple of inches long. If you leave whole pipe cleaners, they use whole pipe cleaners. But for some reason, they cut straws as needed. Paint a wall green or hang up a Dollar Tree green tablecloth. See what photos they can come up with, what backgrounds they can put themselves in. Give them a theme, maybe. Have a contest for a special dessert at lunch or lunch with the principal. Remember to utilize outdoor spaces, potting tables to play with natural elements, uh, sculptures or large versions of games, a stage to play act on, some musical instruments. That's what's in the top left. Those uh, tubes make different sounds when you bang them with things. Be sure to show off student creations as many ways as possible. Get the hallways filled with student work. Rotate it often. Utilize social media. Send pictures home. We've been saying it on, on Twitter for a few years. Don't just turn it in. Publish it. Get a student committee to create and self-publish a yearbook of creations. All of the signage around the school can and should be creative and made by the students. Replace, cover up all the room number signs with new student designs. Let students personalize them for each teacher. Change them out once in a while. Make your place scream. Around here, we are creative. Which of those school-wide culture building ideas do you guys already do? Which ones piqued your interest? Which ones can you try next week? Next month? Next year? Now would be a good time to take a couple minutes to share in a Padlet, a Wakelet, or in the chat. What do you think of school-wide ways to promote curiosity and creativity? So they just see it all around them. So it just becomes every fiber of their being. There are some considerations to think about with maker-centered learning. Learning is messy. Oh, so messy. The path people take to learning, vastly different, and you can't force them all on the same path. The journey is truly the long and winding road. Some of you might know that song. Plus, people drop stuff on the floor. Floors get messy you got to get people to understand the idea of leaving the space better or cleaner than it was. And that's hard to get kids to clean up because it wasn't them that dropped it. It was somebody else. How comfortable can you get with organized chaos? That's an important thing, and everyone's got different levels. Time. Time, such, such a big factor. True learning takes time. Creativity takes time. Curiosity takes time. How do we give everyone the time that they need to explore and learn? Everyone learns at a different pace. How do we find time for all those conversations that we want to have? Where the learning happens, where the assessment happens, where we figure out what's really going on. We only have so many hours in class. 
But the learning is so much better when we give the time that they need. I haven't focused very much on tools and materials in this presentation. Just saying, you know, use what you got. Uh, for one reason, there's just an infinite number of materials. You know, we there's a little bitly down there. We uh, came up with a spreadsheet from A to Z kind of thing. It, we just keep adding to it. Uh, anything can be a material, even dirt. Use what you can easily get. Dumpster dive. Collect recyclables. Ask for donations. Be, be very specific and careful when you ask for donations. Pick like a day or a week kind of thing and ask for certain things um, to kind of keep it focused. Um, you know, another reason I didn't even talk about it, it Maker is not so much about the stuff. It's about the thinking and the conversations that you can have focused with, with that artifact focused. Fo we're focused on that artifact. Uh, tools, there's such a wide variety of tools at a wide variety of prices, too. Uh, no two schools have the same stuff. No school can have everything. You know, you got to get you know, what the kids want. What will they use? Sometimes they don't know, but sometimes they've got ideas. Um, what will your community support? Another important things. Um, remember, you can't have everything because storage is an issue for everybody. You need stuff to create with. You got to have someplace to put it and some way to organize it. Um, You'll have projects that are in progress. You need some place to put them. Uh, everybody's answer is different, but you got to get a plan. You need shelves, maybe carts. Uh, portable is good. Get things on wheels, even shelves on, on wheels to move them in, move them out. You, you're going to have a variety of totes and boxes. Um, I suggest clear so you can see what's in them. Even, you're going to ha even though you're going to have them all labeled awesomely, and some people suggest word labels and picture labels. Um, you still want clear, um, and you got to have things out. They've got to be visible. Um, they 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 can't use what they don't know they have. So if it's stuck in a closet somewhere, they don't know they can use it. Um, as the saying goes, out of sight, out of mind. You know, I know you're wondering. I've thrown a lot at you. you know, how do I do? any of this as a chinese proverb says a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step take one step then put one foot in front of the other that's picture that song is that picture um start with one topic one maker-centered learning experience one learn from it it'll probably feel like it failed because it's such a such a different thing than most of what most of us do Anything new is hard and different. So you need to judge it and evaluate it differently. Um, ask the kids. How'd it go? What can we do better with it? Do you, want to do, you want to do that again? Hopefully they will. I think they like... The kids love learning and they love doing stuff. Um, maybe give them the reins on something and see where, where, where they will take things. You know, I, I maybe be like the, the bumpers and bumper bowling. Just keep them moving forward. Let them, you know, give them some, some path, give them some width, and just keep them going down the lane. You know, here's what you got to remember. These kids will literally make the future. But if we don't give them a chance to learn how to do that now, what kind of future are they going to make? So I've got some resources I can share with you. Um, every space needs to have examples of how to connect paper and cardboard for construction purposes, since so much of the prototyping can be done with these simple, um, relatively inexpensive materials. So you need uh, examples like that. Sometimes it's a great first project for kids to, to partner up and make some of those, make some of their own posters, have them around the halls. Um, these pictures are easy to find with the Google search. 3D, 3D paper, paper connection techniques, cardboard attachment techniques. Um, but you got to have them up and around for them to see them. There's a whole ton of books out there. Um, I have a list of a hundred, about a hundred books. I haven't read them all. Kind of categorized them a little bit for, for students, for teachers, or projects. I know there's many more out there. 
if I'm re missing some really important ones, please let me know. Um, I will get them in there. The teacher books are intended for us to learn more about uh, maker-centered learning. These two are often considered to be the top, top of the pile. Uh, Invent to Learn by Sylvia uh, Marti Lebo Martinez and Gary Steger. And then the Maker-Centered Learning book from the Agency by Design Initiative at Harvard's Project Zero. They're pretty much considered the textbooks. Um, since Dale Doherty kind of started the whole maker community thing with Make Magazine, you know, a while back, you should re really read his, his book, Free to Make. And then Lifelong Kindergarten by Mitchell Resnick from the MIT Media Lab is a great read about what education can and should be. It's very maker-centric. You know, educators often talk about the C's of education, but rare, rarely they talk about the P's. People working on projects based on their passions, in collaboration with peers, in a playful spirit. Um, if you need some quicker reads about maker-centered learning and makerspaces, grab Worlds of Making by Laura Fleming and The Maker Mentality by Nicholas Provenzano. Laura is an educator in New Jersey, and Nick is an educator in Michigan. Obviously, there are tons of books uh, about maker projects. Which ones are the best depends on your audience and your goals and topics. Uh, kids' books uh, are examples of them. You know, they got all the whole Ada Lace and her pals, Rosie Revere and her pals. Um, Oops is a great one for them to, to read or have around about making mistakes because we all know making is rife with oopses. You can also do story time and read parts of the stories to them. Uh, kids of almost all ages like being read to. You can read them in little chunks if you want. Uh, you can have picture books and elementary books in a high school setting. They just activate the brain differently, uh, which is an awesome thing. That's what we're trying to get make happen. Um, if you've got to do digital stuff, uh, especially if you got to do it remotely, virtually kind of thing, I've created a list of um, creation design websites that are browser-based, so they'll work on a Chromebook. Some people call this virtual makerspace. So bit.ly slash virtual maker, the V and the M are capital. That'll get you to that list of things. And it's from music to drawing to coding to Lego building, all sorts of things. Uh, meme, now do I have memes in there? Maybe not memes, um, but lots of things. There are some good hashtags to follow. Um, STEM and maker have a great deal in common. So following, the, you know, if you some people are like, well, why am I following STEM? Well, because STEM and Maker are almost are kind of like uh, two Venn uh, diagram circles that overlap and overlap a lot, and sometimes they overlap completely, and sometimes not completely. So you know, just follow some of those hashtags. Google some of those hashtags. If you're still wondering why Maker. And I didn't do a very good job for this past time. Uh, but here's the other thing. You know, we keep talking about workforce and where these kids are going to be in the future and what uh, skills and, and things they need to be able to do. Um, Maker helps develop all of the top 10 workforce skills that are needed to be successful. Uh, they really do. So you look at what they're talking about 2015 to 2020. Um they just they help with all of them. If you have anything to share, any resources shared, uh, you know, pop them to me in the feedback or email them to me. Um, if you have some feedback on this presentation, that would be awesome too. Um, I can share uh, resources that you send to me out on Twitter for more more people to get. Thank you for spending time with me. I always love to talk about maker ideas. If you want to talk about more about maker education, contact me on Twitter at Shirky17 or drop me an email, paul at paulshirkoff.org. Thank you very much and have an awesome day. One more note, I will be in the meeting hub today, Wednesday, 
from 2.30 to 3.30. That's a half hour from now. Thought we could use a little bathroom break. And also tomorrow, Thursday, from 11.30 to 12.30. Thank you.